So uh, welcome everybody here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center. My name is Frank Henschke and I'm the director of the Siegel Center. We bridge academia and professional theater, but especially international, global theater and American theater. And it's been a long a tradition for us to invite writers, artists from around the world, from the planet. We think of a planetary consciousness now. All big problems in the world are planetary, we think, whether it's racism, uh, violence against women, poverty, uh, the climate catastrophe we live on. So this has been a very important um, um, part of us. And um, we have a longstanding collaboration with theater artists from Europe, especially Eastern Europe. Uh, my great colleague, Daniel Gerald, the late Daniel Gerald, a great man of the theater, a great translator of Witkiewicz and so many, many others, um, um, published a journal which was called Slavic and Eastern European Theater over 25 years when there was very little information coming out. And uh, when Poland also was looked at as a superpower in theater, and it still is very powerful country with a great tradition. And we were really uh, honored to connect to it. So we thank uh, um, the Polish Cultural Institute for collaborating with that, Tomek. Uh, and um, we want, of course, to welcome uh, Martina with us. So um, a special round of applause for a great writer uh, who comes here. And um, it's always awkward, of course, to be on display, to be in front of people. You have to say something. But if you have done it so all so often, but um, I would like to take this evening, you know, to really think about, you know, why do we do art? Uh, what does it mean? Why do we write? And we have with us a great artist, also a successful artist. Not always the same combination. You know, sometimes successful ones are not great, and often <laughs> great ones are not successful. And um, and so um, I think this is a really a great opportunity to spend time in the room with someone who is really has thought about it, dedicated her life to theater under very difficult circumstances. Maybe we talk a little bit. And the solutions she found where she says, this is how I want to tell my story. Some people write poems, some do essays, some are journalists, and some do sculpture, and some write plays. And we come and look to it. And it's a, a wonderful expression of uh, artistic inspiration of mankind. And so this is a very special moment. And I hope. Um, we uh, will we'll have something that will make worth your time. We need great theater, great writers. We also do need great audiences. So really thank you for coming out on a Monday after Thanksgiving. We have a golden rule at the Siegel Center. Never ever do an event Monday after Thanksgiving because nobody comes. We did events here once or twice. People could, we had three or five people even before Corona and we said ne never again. But Martina could only come uh, tonight. We changed it from another date. And, um, but, you know, I'm very impressed. But also would like to thank HowlRound. We are actually live streamed uh, by a nonprofit, uh, a US based uh, theater platform, a fantastic partner for over 10, 15 years, right in the way when they started, we collaborated. So we welcome our uh, viewers from HowlRound. Thank you for taking the time. So we're going to start now. Once I sit down, uh, we're going to start our uh, conversation. If you have a cell phone, take it out for a moment. I'll do two and make sure that little thing is off or power off or switched off, whatever it says. And we use a microphone because it's recorded. Otherwise, you know, often um, a voice would carry. So, um, Martina, first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. <laughs> so how did you get here tonight? The A train. <laughs> A train? Where do you live? I'm in I'm uptown in the Heights. Uptown in the Heights. So um, tell us a little bit, what are you working on at the moment? First of all, does everybody know about Martina? Do is someone who hasn't I would mean, maybe you meant that more poetically but how did you get here and I was like the, the A train yes no I <laughs> meant like, it yeah, yeah 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 but uh, also you how the, you like, got the here. poetic the poetic thing. you know she's of course one of the great uh, temporary playwrights here uh, in America highly uh, if you read the web page bio which we you know don't have to go through you know highly awarded highly acclaimed uh, with many of her plays so um maybe start what what how how did your day start today what are you working on 
Um, this morning I started with a Zoom uh, in, in London, New York, um, with uh, my collaborators for the great, I'm doing an adaptation of The Great Gatsby um, with Florence Welch from Florence and the Machine and Thomas Bartlett or Dove Man is his other, is his other um, musical persona. The Florence of Florence. The Florence, the Florence of Florence and the Machine. Um, the dog days are not over. Um, we it's yeah they they spent about a month making some more new music and so we had a listening session, um, went over a new draft um, that started at nine a.m. and then I did more did, I did more writing on, on the draft. Um, oh gosh, what did I, um, it, e emails like it's a, it's a, I feel like most of a, every single day is different um sometimes I'll, right now it's a lot of a lot of musical work in preparation for the premiere is going to be happening in June and at ART um and uh it's my first musical that's getting produced so I feel like I'm learning as I go I didn't I hadn't written a libretto until I started working on this um but it's delightful I love working on musicals writing is I hate writing it writing is horrible writing is so agonizing it's so lonely and this way you get to be less lonely only because there's somebody there with you so like when I am in the muck I know that Florence is in the muck and it's nice to know that you know I can email her or text her and be like doesn't this suck and she goes yes it does suck I'm like oh it's just so nice to have that kind of <laughs> camaraderie in the, in the process of making um I I hate writing but I love being in the rehearsal room I love collaborating with people which is why I do theater um if I had all the right answers I would write novels in a room by myself and then just you know ship them off but I love the coming together of people of various backgrounds and um experiences to to ask questions of something that I'm obsessed with you know I my first draft of a play or anything is a hypothesis I don't know if it's as true as it could be and then I bring it to other people and we ask it questions and we um work together and they bring they bring up ideas that make me that 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 make me think of new things and it's just it's such a dynamic way of making and I find it so enlivening for my imagination so I suffer through the writing the lonely writing so that I can be in the in the room with other people yeah let's let's talk about the cost of writing um <laughs> I think as far as I know you're the only Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who says um I fucking hate writing. That's not true. Is you should ask more of the writers. Oh, we all so fucking hate it. Said it. And uh, I hate it so much. Agonizing. Um, um, so how do you write? Do you work on a computer? Are you at home? Uh, how, how does it work? How do you do it? I think I've I've been asked question I've been asked the question of what do you need to write and uh, I mean some people will say oh I need my special pencil I need my like I just need some urgency and some usually some some somebody who has wronged me or has wronged a character that I feel deeply about um, and so there's just uh, you know I can write at any time of the day as long as I know why I'm writing um, I now one two dead battery that's what mine is. It's screaming as it's it's a <laughs> exclamation point dead battery. It's a ring. I'll pass it off to you. Um, it, yeah, no, I just need so, so sometimes it can be just the uh, the urgency and the purpose of writing a scene that I then kind of figure out how they how these scenes are speaking to each other. Um, I, I have experienced two kinds of plays and two kinds of playwriting. One that comes right from the front of the brain, almost like a dotted line to the page. And I write it really quickly. My first play, Ironbound, I wrote in five days. And Sanctuary City was in three days um, because I was so, fr I, like, I just canceled everything. I told people that I uh, was sick I think, uh, and I stayed home and I, and I wrote them because I was afraid of losing them. Uh, and then there are some plays that if I come from the back of the brain where you just kind of keep pulling at something that, isn't, that, that you can't quite see bring it forward oh now this is a fun game it I is well. <laughs> yeah. it was this was amazing this was like as soon as you got handed the microphone mine died it's fantastic um yeah this is this is basically art making it's like you'll be hand you'll be you'll you know passing things off it dies in your hand and you have to just like figure out a fucking solution for what else to do next <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, um, um, so, what are your what are your earliest memories of art or theater? What what did you see first? My grand was in Poland. My grandfather was a painter, but being a painter in Poland under a certain regime meant you you know had were very limited in what you what what you could make, and so he. Um, uh, worked on commission, uh, but I would I would see 
he had a little tiny room that was his sort of sacred room um, where oftentimes he would paint family members or historical um, uh, portraits and and like these epic, beautiful heroes on horses and landscapes and the, the natural world. Um, he like paint, he painted um, my my like baby room. I wouldn't even call it a room. It was like a corner in this tiny little, you know, Kamenica in Poland. Um, uh, and so I, I witnessed somebody's like they, he, he needed to paint like he needed to breathe. Um, and I, uh, I found that, so I wanted to be like him. I looked up to him. And so then I tried to draw and paint. Um, and, uh, I, I think it was, it wasn't like, oh, I saw something and was moved by, it. I saw somebody's love of the thing. So that felt so core to who they were. Um, uh, and he just felt more alive than other people did. And maybe that was, I, I, I had a, I had a kinship with him. Um, so that was, yeah, my first was watching, was seeing what he, in a, in a tiny, tiny little um, apartment in Poland covered with paintings um, that he, that he had made about things that he loved. It was kind of social realist paintings or what school it was? Yeah, pretty, yeah, realism. I know, I know nothing about visual arts. Uh, I thought I would be a visual artist because I, at one point and I, I, I like applied to Cooper Union and I was like, I'll be a visual artist if I get into Cooper Union. And they were like, no. And so I was like, fine, mm. I will go somewhere else and ended up being a playwright. But interesting in a way, also kind of realistic uh, portraits uh, and not in an abstract school or expressionist one. I guess that, yeah, that makes me think of, oh no, psychoanalysis, this is fun, uh, where he would take the people that mattered to him and make them, you know, in, 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 in case them in something immortal um, in paintings. And maybe this is something that I feel like I committed to as well is the people that I care about wanting to, you know, when my bones are dust, like this is all that's going to be left of me is these words, hopefully, if they're good, if people find use in them. And they're in a, my hope for them is that they're, they're elongating and elevating the lives of people that I, that I was, or that I knew that historically have been not given as much of a voice or as big of a platform or as seen as with as much dignity and humor and sexuality and all the things that nuance that, that I have seen them to have growing up hmm. um what what does it mean to you the the writing when did you say i don't do painting like my grandfather i paint write with my pen or your typewriter or your computer i don't know how you started writing how do how did i start writing um by by well i mean to i'll, I'll be i grew up with a lot of domestic violence when we first moved to the country. Um, and so I would have to often- How old were you when you came here? Oh, I hate that question. Yeah. You know why? Um, because people are ready to judge you for whether you're enough or you're, which is, which is great. I actually like answering the, the question about the question because I think um, when you were born in another country uh, and then you come to this, you're always, you have one foot in one world, one foot in another world. Um, even if you came really young, I came really young, which is why I had this American mouth. I wish I had an accent. Oh my God. I sometimes will put it on. I'll go to Greenpoint and I'll like try and, you know, pretend like I belong. Um, but I just, I just don't feel enough in either world. And so when I, I never answer the, people have like found out how, what, what, year, what, how old I was when I came. Um, but I don't, I, I, yeah, it bothers me because, because they'll go, oh, well, you're obviously this or, oh, you're this. Uh, and I, I feel frustrated by somebody else defining me, which is why I don't give them any ammunition. <laughs> um, and then I forgot your question. What was the other one before? The, the question was, in a way, when did you start writing? Oh, I started writing, yeah, yeah. Stuff? Was it poetry? Um, was it, it was everything. Was stories, a theater? Yeah, when we, when we, um, so when my, I came with my mom, I was, I was young um, after the wall fell. She left me in Poland at first, and then she came to America um, to check it out, got pregnant, was like, came back to Poland, was like, you mean this anchor baby are moving to America when that was still a thing. Uh, and she, we, she worked in factories and cleaned houses. Um, and uh, we ended up getting in a situation where we were living in a house of a lot of domestic violence. We were there for about 12 years. And um, I would have to find quiet activities to do after school to, that was the safest way to, to maneuver in that house. And so I would lock myself in my bedroom for hours until my mom came home uh, and I would draw and I would uh, paint and I would write. And so I'd get these assignments from school to write two pages and I'd come in with 25 and my poor public school teachers were like, we love you. They don't pay us enough to read 25 pages. Uh, and so I, one of my teachers, so she was so kind. She 
saw that I had a desire to make, she, didn't, she didn't, maybe didn't know why there was a desire, but she saw I had a desire to make and, and to um, reach out uh, beyond, beyond myself. And she found a playwriting competition that was happening in New Jersey. I didn't know what the hell a play was. I thought it was a film that you couldn't afford to make, which not wrong, not untrue, not untrue. Uh, in America. In America, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I was like, I'll write a play. Um, it was so bad, I'm sure. Um, and and had high production value because I thought I was writing a fucking movie. Um, and but the more the most meaningful thing was that this teacher would stay after school with me um for hours uh while I performed every role at, for many days on, on over and over uh for for her. And she it was so moving to me because she not only gave she actually gave me a safe space to go to. Um uh and and the gift and encouragement of her attention there was somebody who was saying you matter enough that i'm going to gift you my time to listen to what you have to say about living and i it's that that kind of give give take gifting of attention i think i i um uh, this is what I try to do. And I also, yeah, I'm fed by that, that there's like, there's an, an exchange, there's an aliveness. There's somebody who is giving a bit of their finite lives to my finite life. And we're all just trying to make something to, to make this time as meaningful and full as possible. And so that, you know, that's, I, I started writing plays, I guess, and that uh, from, I didn't, uh, the a few years later, I started working for an adult literacy program that would teach immigrant parents and their preschool aged children English together as an after school program. And how we would do that is we would write these skits and perform them for the, the class. Um, and I would write skits in um, English and Spanish and Polish. And there was a Portuguese writer and the Chinese um, Mandarin writer um, who, and we would perform them for this, for this group. And um, I didn't realize that that was playwriting, that that was theater. Um, they were they were supposed to just be like, what would you say at the cafe? What would you say at the um, bank if you're going to give these to give these parents and their kids sort of muscle memory English? Um, and I took it way. I took it very far. And I was like, there was like a murder heist at the bank. And there was like an affair at the cafe. Uh, and they were like, they just need to know how to order a sandwich. It's not that serious. Um, and uh, I I but again, there was like it was it felt useful. There was there was something that was being exchanged and transferred, and 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 there was a use of I was teaching, I was I was offering uh, practice in English. Um, it made it it all felt like utilitarian in a way that didn't feel like um, that took it out of some kind of like highfalutin art that was for no that was just for me. Like I never thought of it as I'm going to write these diary entries and and um, have you know people perform them. I wanted it, them to feel I wanted it to be a generous act that felt like it was of use, which maybe is a weird way to look at art. Is wanting it to have a use. I mean, it's very capitalist now. <laughs> no, it's a, it's. A, I think that's a good idea that it, to be of use and to, to do meaningful things. Um. What did you? You said you were drawing. You were writing. What did you read? What did I read? I read everything. I read. My mother used to work at a. She used to work at a book factory. Also, so she would bring a lot of um, was a cookie factory and a book factory, and she would bring a lot of um, cookies and books. Cookies and books, cookies and books. Yeah, she all the all the free shit she brought home. Um, she also, when she would work at a, when she was cleaning houses, she would bring whatever magazines and pamphlets and things that people were leaving for recycling. So it was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of collected, you know, found found texts. I guess we would call them now. Um, but I also was a big nerd. I would go to the library all the time and. Um, I, I did, I read every, I, I became, a, I had obsessions with, with the with various things and I would, did, you know, deep dive. Um, I didn't start reading plays until college. Uh, and my first, um, experience with immigrant fiction was also around that time. I was so moved to, um, to encounter the first book was an interpreter of Mali's by Jhumpa Lahiri. Uh, and it was about, it, you know, it was a, it was a collection of short stories by this Bengali American writer, uh, that I felt so connected to because it was, uh, she's like such a, such a different background, but I, just the fact that there was immigrant fiction was so moving to me. I thought, oh, maybe then there's, there's space for my stories. Um, uh, I, that I think it sort of showed me that we're more alike than we are dissimilar. Um, and, and our, and our, specific specificity is beautiful but that there's actually a lot of commonality in in a lot and a lot of the immigrant the immigrant experience even that feels like a um un 
a limiting term because an, a, the immigrant experience can be so different based on how you came, what status you were, whether what gender you pr you present as, wh were you sponsored over, do, were you undocumented, do you was it academic, like all of these things. But there's so that there's so many things that we still can connect over. Um, uh, that that I I felt encouraged by that. So I read, I also read a lot of. Um, uh, sto I, I connected to a lot of stories about discarded people. So like The Outsiders was my favorite book. I love that someone went, mm. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's like people who, they're all orphans. Like they themselves makeshift families. I love makeshift families because that's those narratives because I think that's what immigrants do as well. Like they have to make their own worlds in in their in the new world. And um, a lot of working class narratives, Dorothy Allison, um, Juno Diaz, uh, yeah, so things, a lot of things. I have a very long answer to your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, that's important um, um, to see what what um, you know what what inspired you and what you um, what you were thinking. Um, your work, you know, it's kind of anti-sentimental, some of those, but it's a realistic uh, kind of uh, hyper-realistic almost, but a realistic representation of the world, a style that. Um, is in a way close to television of or, or, or film. Um, there is a New York school of playwriting that is closer in a way to surrealism or is closer to abstract writing as to fantastical um, imagination like a Sybil Kempson or or uh, many others. Um, how, how how did you come? To decision, this is the play I want to write. Uh, six women in a basement in Queens, or you know, to a relationship between caregivers, a husband and uh, and wife. So, how did you come to the decision? Um, I'll paint like your grandfather in a realistic way. I don't think it's so. I think actually, there's um, uh, one of the one of the most um, inspiring playwrights that I. I love is Connor McPherson and he writes realism in a sense of like there's this is how gravity works and this is the this is the class of people that are in this very specific place but there's something ab above and containing them that feels otherworldly um and beyond that is at least endeavoring to transcend people's um very uh, kind of quotidian lives um, that I'm really, maybe this is like being raised, you know, Catholic, very bad Catholic, bad, bad. Um, but it's, but there's, there's like a, there's a, there's transmogrification. There's a, there's like a, there's, there's sacraments, there's ritual, there's this, um, uh, there's something beyond that I think I'm really attracted to and try to, or, or I kind of, uh, so it's like realism plus something that I think I, I, cause I, I don't, I wouldn't even call myself realism. I don't know. Um, you would, you would, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, civil camps, I'm not doing, not doing that, but, but I, I play with time. I play with geography, um, lands of uh, dream, dream worlds, nightmares. Um, I think the things that, um, oh, I was reading, this was so interesting. I, um, the, I never know how to say this, this writer's name, but Ursula Gwynn, is, is that how you say the, she has this carrier bag theory. Do you all know this? Everyone's very smart here. I just realized what this was. Oh, oh, it's fantastic. Okay, so, um, it was a, it was uh, oh my gosh, how do I explain? Um, the the carrier bag theory. She has a theory that um, female writing and female stories, uh, a, a lot of female characters are the are the holders of a narrative. That, um, uh, and what and how they move through time. Somebody else will, will correct me if this, that, that, and be smart about this. How they how they move through their narratives is they collect and they gather. And so sometimes you might. It, it's less of a. Um, a, a male narrative of a spear pr propulsing forward, uh, you know, conquering and 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 meeting people on their on their on their singular quest. It's more of a collection and a gathering of experiences that they then carry. And I, when I when I somebody was responding to one of my plays by by bringing this up, and I. And I love that so much. And I feel like this is also what women do is we hold the culture and we hold the stories. We, you know, pass on the stories of our of our families and we are the keepers of um, uh, like, you know, like you, it's your grandmother's food that you like think about as 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 part of your, your identity and your past. Um, and so I 
um, I think that there's a carrier bag theory of, um, within within my plays as well of of um, people holding things beyond time and space. Um, that uh, if everything has been stripped of you, if everything's been taken from you, you can, nobody can take your stories. Um, and that's what's so people and memories and, and experiences are collected. So uh, yes, realism plus. I think there's something beyond and most and why I wrote about caregivers and and you know uh, various women in in living in a basement apartment temporarily is I will tend to write composites of people that I know or I grew up with. Um, there's something usually personal that's happening for me that I um, will that will start my imagination will start churning based on something I've heard, um, an anecdote, a piece of music, some a piece of dialogue somebody said, um, or an image I've seen that, that like keys up that thing that is personal, uh, and has me start to, uh, I'll, I'll hear voices. We're so writers are so strange. You know, we'll, we'll hear, we'll, we'll, we'll hear voices and, and, um, that's normal. And when we don't hear voices, that's scary. Uh, and so I will hear the, I, I never write biographies for characters. I listen to how they talk and they sort of tell me where they're, where they're from and what they, what, the, what things I need to discover about them. Um, you sit in a room and they talk to you. It's so, yeah. <laughs> I, I believe it. Absolutely. Yeah. Or I'll, you know, I'll be wandering in the park. It's usually when I'm, uh, the last place they come is when I'm looking at a computer and I'm being like, come to me and they will resist. Um, but I'll be moving through the day and something will, um, yes, yeah, show itself to show itself to me. I'll hear something that then makes me feel like I can, uh, there's, there's propulsion. There's something more. Um, uh, the plays, uh, you know, I told you I hate writing. One the, another reason why I continue to do so is is um, because by the end of having written, the plays become smarter than I could have ever been before I started them. And so there's something that's at the end of the making of a play that m my subconscious is protecting me from looking at in the present probably because it wants me to have a healthy life. And, <laughs> uh, and so I, but we have so many ways of hiding from ourselves and each other, um, which is protective, but it's also very limiting and um, uh, deadly and destructive. Um, and so the, the making of a play is asking you to look at that thing and a good play has no bullshit. And we have so many ways to be, to have be full of bullshit in our daily, in our daily lives that the plays are resisting a bad, a good play is not, is going to be truthful. Um, and, uh, I go through the process of making them so I can figure out how to be a fuller, more honest version of myself. Um, still on it. I'm still working on it. I don't know, but, um, Yes, I've answered. I've said so many things. I don't know if I've answered any of your questions. <laughs> I'm just wondering. All answers. Uh, so, so do you also see things or you hear things? Both, but I, but I, um, I see a stage. I've asked, I've asked um, students like when they're writing plays, do they want, do they see the movie version of it? And I think I always see a stage. Like, where are they coming from? Um, I find it the most, the most like evocative atmosphere is to be in a, in a, in an empty theater. Uh, and just imagining who could be, who could walk on and what could they say. And it's a very Peter Brooks, but I, I just think that that's so, it's so thrilling. A, a whole world is created by a word. That's so, it's, um, it's so powerful to me. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll hear things. I'll see things. Um, I won't know who a character is necessarily until, um, they speak. No bios. Mm -hmm. So you kind of you know you know a medium you write the things from uh, things you experience you see so um, there a, a, st a strong contemporary school of play is documentary theater with like verbatim interviews um, collage of existing material how how about your work is anything do you, do you interview someone or you just oh, no. listen to it? how do what do you think about that work I bless like I don't I would find it so inhibiting to try to to try to represent an actual specific person um also in terms of research I will usually know enough about something because I've experienced it in some in in, in some way or I was close to it and I'll write it and then I'll re and, and then I'll research after to make sure I've I've covered my basis and made, made it as full as possible because I think when I've over researched 
I get so obsessed with the like cool trivia that then that's all there is, is the cool trivia. And it feels like showing off and that's stupid. Um, and, and distancing instead of, um, asking myself in the writing, why am I interested in, it keeps it alive as opposed to doing homework. Why am I interested in pursuing this topic, this person, this relationship, this dynamic? Um, and then I, and then I have to just meet everybody as characters that also happen to be X, Y, Z in the world. Um, a lot of times um, because of the characters I'm writing, their political circumstances are just, they're inherent to who they are. Like I'm sanctuary city, like there's their immigration status dictates what they're a, a, what they're able to do, what they have access to, um, how they are thinking about themselves in the world. It's uh, I'm interested in like how that manifests in psychology and 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 like the actions that we um, uh, the, the 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 impulses and the self sabotage like like for sanctuary city, I thought it was so um, I'm trying to make a series out of sanctuary city mostly because I want to continue to investigate what it is for somebody to grow up in a place that doesn't want them that makes them feel unwelcome what does that do to uh every part of it, it, the the insides of a person and how they then have to f maybe maybe feel like they have to prove themselves um uh this is also why i'm obsessed with the great gatsby because i feel like gatsby is a working class character and this is being streamed on how so i can't reveal the secrets but um he gatsby is very close to me people, people <laughs> know the novel maybe I but by sure for what i'm doing <laughs> yeah that that is that is very interesting to think about you know what does it really mean and i think this is what uh, is so brilliant in your plays that you really spend time with them for a moment also in these kind of uh, sharp dialogue dialogues you know cut they cut the dangerous characters you know they would I think harm other characters in other plays, you know, so uh, <laughs> they know what they want, like uh, what the they don't want, or um, they have a history, you know, that is pushing them. You can feel the weight um, of it. Um, you um, say in a way you have a foot in two countries, there's Poland, there is um, America, you know, I think you mentioned somewhere, oh, what if my mom would have gone to the UK? What plays would I be writing? Which is an interesting question. How much is you and how much is actually the context of you. But in a way, uh, you're close to your mother, or, or let's say your mother America, but the father, father Poland, or your father is missing. Um, how, how does that, that uh, influence, in a way, your work? And, um, and is, you know, Poland, in a way, I guess you live here, is missing. How does that manifest itself in your work? Well, I have therapy on Wednesday, but I guess I have it now. <laughs> Um, I never met my father. And so in a way I didn't have a thing to miss. I think people who grew up with two parents and then one parent left have it harder because they know what to miss. They have specific things that they, you know, uh, will no longer be part of their life. Um, so I grew up in a world of mostly women and mostly single mothers. When we moved to America, Everybody was working class, mostly from various, uh, mo mostly immigrants from various places. It's very multicultural. Um, and so I understood uh, America to be a place where everyone's from somewhere else and they're all raised by women with accents. Um, <laughs> and I feel very comfortable in that world. <laughs> um, uh, and to the point that my, I actually, I just, I just came back from um, uh, visiting my sister who just has, she has a 19 month old um, and I watch her and her husband and I'm like, well, oh my God, there's a man here. What do you do? This is fascinating. You also changed the diaper. Wow. Um, so everything is like a plus. Um, and, and, but I, but I am curious about he's some, I, I know about who my father was and he stayed in Poland um and i am curious about how much is you know how much is nature nurture what is you know what's what's um what who might who might he be that i am also um but i guess i'd have i just do that in my plays i i live i have grown up with my mother um and I'm incredibly close to her but there's still things she will not tell me I don't know if anybody else has this experience as like a first gen person, but like your parents don't tell you anything. My, it has only served my mother to not to say less. Um, and then she gave birth to me who just wants to talk all the fucking time about everything um, and unearth all the things and, and present them to other people. Um, so you can be 
you can see your parent every day and still not know actually who they are who, or who you are in relation to them. So maybe I find, I find solace in this. I might never know. Our parents are our great mysteries, um, whether we see them or we don't. Um, and Poland, I, I feel more close to an identity as a first-gen immigrant than specifically to Poland, um, even though I, that's the first language I grew up in. Um, and, and I think it's, it's mostly because I felt connected to people from various parts of the world growing up um, there, of which, of which one of those pockets was, was Polish and Poland. And so I don't feel like I'm not connected. It just it actually feels like it is one thing that is a part of others, um, other, as, uh, other identities and cultures that I, that I grew up in, you know, because of the because of the domestic violence, I would often run. I have to run away to to friends' houses, and so I ended up learning Spanish as at, as at a young age because I was hanging out with, uh, I was hanging out with my Puerto Rican family, so my um, Puerto Rican friends' family's house, or um, the my like Mexican friends' family's house, and um, uh, it was just this um, and, and finding commonalities that 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 that, that we had. Um, though I, my whole family's still in Poland. My mom is here. My sister was born the, the anchor baby. <laughs> the anchor baby was born here um in Newark uh and I've gone also because of the sort of controlling nature of my stepfather we weren't able to go back very often and so that eroded a lot of connection er early on that I then tried to rebuild once I was able to go to uh, go back to Poland and start to like rebuild those connections because at first it was we didn't have enough money to go back I was like, we, first it was we were being controlled and weren't able to go back and then it was I decided to be an artist and I had to make the choice of will I spend my my limited resources toward time to write and make and learn or will I use it to go visit my family in another country and I I had like a, a breakdown a few years ago when I realized oh I didn't even I accidentally became American by making the choice to be an artist because I was making the choice to use that the, the money and the time to study and make in, instead of devoting it to family, which I guess is the, which is the, maybe the universal female work, work, you know, work family, work family, um, that, that we, that we have to make. So I, I wish I spoke better Polish. I speak it and I can write it, but I have this accent in it that I, I when I go back, when I go to Poland, I fit in until I open my mouth and they're like, nah, she's American. Um, uh, but I, but I, I wish I was, um, I I, I want to be a part of it. Like there was a, there was a, there was a debate on Facebook a few years ago amongst the Polish artists. Um, it was the year that Pawlikowski won the Oscar, Tokarczuk had won the book, or, the book prize this was before mm -hmm. the Nobel. And then it was the year that I won the Pulitzer. And so there was a heated debate on Facebook um, about, do I count as a Polish person in this like a year of extraordinary Polish achievements? Uh, um, I later on found the woman who started the debate and I went up to her in Poland uh, and said some words, but- uh, uh, What words? Um, we can't talk about that, on how around. <laughs> but I did get in her face. Um, Cause I just, I'm like, what the fuck? Why, why would you default? You don't know me? <laughs> you don't know me. You don't know anybody. You don't fucking know anybody. Like let us, you know, let us define ourselves and, and um, we're judged enough. Uh, I do belong. We should, we all, we, we, wouldn't it be nicer if we all just felt like we belong? I think we'd have a lot, the, the world would be a lot um, less destructive if we, if we just tried to make each other belong and, and find the commonalities in each other and, and respect and lift up our, our differences. Mm. Thanks friend. <laughs> yeah. We once had the great writer, I think director Karl Henkel Rex here, and he, he grew up in foster families, actually in five foster homes. And he said he had no family at all. Um, who he knew from his biological family. And he said, so he would have imaginations. So he said in one uh, family home, he found Racine, a very complex, classical, French, uh, 17th century writer for the, you know, with the relations of the kings and the fights and the sister. And, whatever. and he said, I felt most at home, you know, because I imagined a family. Is it a little bit, let's say the your, your play Queens, um, um, you have the, Inna and Rina. So, are they are, are these um, your family members? Do you feel um, they represent you in their complexity? They are like all parts talking to each other of what's happening in your in your brain. What do you think? 
It does. It does feel like whatever you, whether whether you intend to or not, your DNA as a person is going to present itself in your plays, and you might try to change it, but it's it's the same thing that the play is going to be smarter than you. The play is also going to show you who you are, um, and so I think there's a re, you know we're, we when we make we're constantly. Um, we when we make a decision you're doing violence right to like the various of other possibilities that could have existed and so we all have a bias and we all have a limit our, our imagination and our experiences are limited and so like when you make you're making choices constantly i think this is why writing is so agonizing because you know you have to we have to make so many decisions as it is in life and so it's a constant um form of decision making which can feel fluid and um and and lovely and there's flow at times but sometimes it can be agonizing because you have to want you have, you're, you're just looking at which way do i which way do i go um so i i think that for queen specifically it was a lot of the it they were composites of the people that i grew up with who were from various places in the world that that um helped my mother uh when my when my uh, I, I, what I what I am interested in that play is somebody who's doing a second immigration, a second migration. You first come from the country of your birth to America, and then what if your community that you find here rejects you? Um, what is what's what's beautiful? Uh, be belonging in groups are beautiful, but also inherent to groups is exclusion, because it means some people cannot be a part of it, and so. Um, uh, what happens if you've come from one place to a new place, but that place rejects you and you have to find a new, you have to find a new community that might be with people who seemingly don't have as much in common with, with you. When my, when my mom left my stepfather, she was rejected from the Polish community because they were, uh, they were his friends and she was leaving and she was rejecting him. And so then she had to find um, help in people who were not Polish. And so I thought that that was beautiful. Um, some people, some Polish people, Polish Americans helped her, but, uh, but, but it was also that she was reaching out to other people and finding commonalities of, of, uh, w amongst various women, mostly women, um, uh, to help, to help her through who like brought us clothes, you know, when we were like in the shelter and, um, who let us crash on their couch and things like that, that, that was, um, I also think that this is this, this kind of, um, caregiving is something i'm interested in specifically in a in a, in a country in america in, in in this country that doesn't that makes policy that that doesn't want everybody to equally thrive like they're they're um you, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you can absolutely achieve your american dream but it's not level we don't all start in the same place and we have you know we, we have our obstacles are very are, are very different and so it's but there's a there can be this shame then that that we feel if we don't achieve these dreams because we're the, because what we're supposed to america's promised we've said that this um that we should be able to and what's wrong with us if we don't and i think that that can like build up in toxicity um and, and it also means that it, the ways that this country doesn't take care of everybody puts extra pressure on the relationships in that person's life um, that that aren't caring for them in the way that the potential of the country could be. Um, and uh, that's something uh, the makeshift families, um, uh, dynamics in relationships, especially in romantic relationships where there's a sometimes there's like a, a currency it's exchange, it's like it's a money that's um that you what can i do for you that you're gonna you know you can do for me um uh that i find really interesting i think is in queens and it's in, in a lot of the plays of how we have the, the the pressure of having to care for one another when the country doesn't want us to be doesn't want us all to win and all yeah, it's there. true what does it mean if you reject it and on top of it don't see a future and perhaps really don't have a future you know so what does it really mean that realization um you, about your place i mean you mentioned i think once tom stoppard uh, and who mentioned that you know, i like that uh, idea it goes to the checkpoint at the airport and you check your suitcase and you say what's in there and then they say actually you have other stuff in there you know you didn't tell us and you forget so what is in your place what is the other stuff do you do you i mean one feels a a lot, a lot of love, you know, and um, even a spiritual sense. Or what is what is in there? Why do you write? To feel less alone. I think. I think most of the 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 the, un, the like underlying Stanislavskian verb <laughs> underneath is to vanquish loneliness. Um, that they're that they're trying to do. I feel like I put together plays 
stories and I offer them to other people and go, you too, maybe, is this you as well? Um, uh, because I, 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 I've never been more moved than in the theater ever. Uh, I just feel so much more connected to every, to, to everybody ar around me. Um, being in the audience of a theater and making theater. And so I just don't know. Um, I don't know another way to feel closer to uh, fellow, my fellow human beings than to, than to, to make something with them for them. That is, that is, that is hopefully also holding all of us for, for like a, you know, for two hours in the dark theater that, that I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the answers. No one has the answers. We don't, we, the, I think part of going to the theater is like, oh, we know, don't, no one has the answers in this. Don't, can we bond, can we bond about this? Um, and then go out into the, you know, leave the dark theater and go out into the world feeling, feeling at least, you know, not alone in our confusion. Um, why do I, why at this point, I don't know. It's too late to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> it's also <laughs> <laughs> right is it's for justice it's for, it's, for, it's, for, it's for justice also it's for it's for money like this is i don't I, i'm so fucking lucky that the things that i have made people have found use in enough to for me to be able to pay my rent and that is fucking luck um i, I feel like anybody who um uh there are so many people who are immensely talented, who work really, really hard, who have important things to say for whatever reason, have not, the gatekeepers have not opened the doors for them. And I'm, I just am so aware of being so fucking lucky that somebody did for me. Um, and so this is what, this is, you know, it's, it's something of the, the soul that I need to do, but it's also like, this is, it seems that, that this is what I have to offer. And I want to be as generous as I possibly can be in what I'm able to make that's outside myself that is in service of something something larger that makes us all ultimately, you know, be less destructive toward each other. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's just luck. I think it's also an extraordinary talent, tenacity. Um, you know, as people say about pop songs sometimes, you know, many people write a song about love. They have lots of melodies, but sometimes a song touches you and nobody knows why. If people would know, most probably they would be billionaires. Some actually are. They, they sometimes really do know. But uh, most of the time, not you. You wrote something. You, a world that you describe resonates. And um, people react to see themselves, but also see the humor, as you often talk about um, in it. Um, if we come to your writing, it feels it, uh, I'm hard to believe the three days or four days um maybe you thought about it love Chekhov is known is you to think three months and then he wrote it in a week um so i don't believe you write it in three days so how does your yeah. editing go oh i love i love rewriting i love it so much i hate the so you do page. write it three days and then you edit it oh, for yeah. well, months or two or three or i don't even see it as editing I, I see it as like finding opportunities for expansion editing feels like it's like cutting and changing and like trying to make some kind of perfect thing which we don't even know what that is um uh perfecting which i don't feel like is what rewriting even though that's the word is rewriting it's a d development we you know in the theater where we, we, we develop plays and that's what it that's what it feels like it's this this um here's my um the, the scaffolding for an idea or the, the the majority of a story and then in collaboration with other people and asking it questions finding opportunities for where it could be more full um where uh where where are there moments when uh people be, uh, I, I could let somebody in into something more and just kind of it, it does this um uh so but the hardest thing is getting all the stuff on the, the 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 page i can rewrite forever that's just that's joyful for me um or develop forever um because it means other people but for them of the plays as you say iron bound or uh, sanctuary it really came out five days for iron bound five days, yeah, uh, what days arthur miller said about death of a salesman he said you know he was, of course it was his entire life but he wrote it out um in two weeks which is amazing this is a stunning um stunning ability uh, for us you know all to listen to someone and be who, who can listen to voices and put something together that reflects the world we live in and creates um a meaning um so um do you write most of the text when you hear voice maybe you go home you write them down you go and you say you love the rehearsal room that's your true home which I think is true. It's one of the few places on planet Earth where people talk to each other. They really have to listen and to talk. 
and they have to make decisions like agreements and stick to it. And that has an end to it. It's about everything, but also nothing. It's a game, but a great game. And I like sports a lot, but it is the greatest game, I think, that you can play in a way. And it's not done in the editing room like film and television, even how powerful it is for the audience member. So um, you bring, let's say, Queens or, I don't know, Cost of Living, you have all the text there and then actors improvise a little bit, change a word here or there. Or oh, the no. How does it? How, no, no, no. So we live, as some say, in the post-traumatic world, you know, where um, you know, the player doesn't often sit in the little room, types everything up. Clifford Odets, you know, had to go upstairs in the attic for the group theater. They'd write the play and finish it, you know, and then it was done. So how, how do you work in that new 21st century way of playwriting? I, I, yeah, actors don't improvise for me. I, I mean, I wish they could just write it for me. That'd be super. You, you, great. Impro you improvise? No, no, no. I, I, some, I sometimes I wish. I'm like, what well, actor? We could, what, what, what if you like were in this scene? What would you do? And they're like, write the fucking scene. Um, I, I need actors to do exactly what's on the page, because if they are generous and fully committing themselves to it, and it's not working, I know it's my fault. Uh, and I have to fix it. But if they don't do what's on the page, again, when my bones are dust, I won't know if it's um, them improvising. Um, uh, is, you know, sometimes there'll, there'll be like a mistake or a discovery. And I'm like, oh, that's great. That's a fantastic opportunity. Maybe we go this way. Um, but if they don't do what's on the page, I won't know whether I need to, what I need to rewrite, what I need to develop. Um, so it's really, uh, it's a lot, it's it's um, asking actors to um, trust and say that this is at least let's try this first and then we'll see and if they do it if that's the if that's the first go and it doesn't feel you know we, we will talk about it and we'll adjust things i'll learn from their first impulses and choices what the what the uh i, I mean this word but, but what the prejudice or what the assumption is about something so that then i can you know man, maneuver around it or or give um set an actor on, on a on a course early that feels right like there's a in the, the opening monologue of cost of living I learned early on I had to, well, one, I had to make an audience laugh in the first 30 seconds of the play or they won't know that they can. They won't feel like they're given permission to because of the subject matter of some of the plays. Um, and so, it, it, because to, you know, to to laugh is to disarm, is to feel welcome. Like I try, I'm, I, it, humor is such like, um, so, some some people need humor because that's their ticket into connection with other with other people. It's a constant like, let me let me be, let me be with you. Um, but I learned um, because the first monologue of Cost of Living is about like alcoholism and a death and like lots, you know, it is about sad things. Um, I had to write that this character would have made a great uncle. And that's how we, that's how you, he's somebody who, um, actually, I have it right here. I'm just going to read it. Yeah, this is we, the like, we, character we, description. We, we advertised it. <laughs> uh, we had I just want the character description. This is most um, an unemployed truck driver. He looks out of place here. Eddie Torres is a man who understands that self-pity and moping are privileges for people who in their lives have friends and family who unconditionally love them and will listen to their shit. Anything he tells you, he hopes will be entertaining or funny or interesting because he knows you're not obligated to stay and to listen to him. When he slips into sadness, he bounces back fast. He would have made a great uncle. I think that is how I feel in the world as well. I feel like I have to earn my place all the time. Um, I'm never enough. If I entertain somebody, maybe I will be. It, it will. I, I will be worthy of their attention. I feel like I have to. You know, there's no. No one is obligated. Anybody could leave. We could all leave right now, and bless you for not. Uh, you know. Uh, but it's 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 um it's active. It's trying to it's uh, trying to reach to stay to to because if you're here, then you'll see me, and therefore I matter. And and um, I I've gone all I don't even know what the fuck question you asked me at first, but I <laughs> no, I think it's the the this the the your scenes they are so crystal clear written or some say it's like sharp as a knife it's clear like an icicle and but also light like a bird's foot someone said that about poetry your your work has that so the question was you know how do you how do you get there and um, is it through working with actors, actors or right. not do they redo it? but so you in the rehearsal room all the time but they change actually very little of the text it is. Or you give I movement suggestions? Or yeah, I'll keep move, I'll keep filling it out, and I, uh, you know, there'll be a number of development processes where there'll be a reading or there'll be a workshop where, um, you know, and different actors will come in with their very specific and different life experiences and um, you know tastes, and so um, the choices that they're making inform 
what I'm learning. I'm learning what they're interpret. I'm learning about the character through their interpretation. And if it doesn't feel right, then I feel like I have to go back um, and and adjust it to give them to give them the 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 tools to come as close to this version of a character that I have in my in my in my mind that is also eventually something that that will move past my under my imagination of that character I when when I uh, another reason why I love the theater is and, and specifically writing for the theater and being in those spaces is because of these a lot of these characters are composites of people I know it feels like resurrecting ghosts it feels like getting to live in a space with people who might no longer be here versions of them like the way that's this person made a joke or their circumstances that feel like it's it's extending the life of people that were meaningful to me um and so there's some there's there's some bit of like that but then it, it's handed off to an actor and they make it completely different to the point that then now it's a character who's who i love i i don't have children but i imagine this is what it's like when someone has a teenager where you're like oh my god you have your own personality that's fantastic but you're still like at your core you know like my child uh and uh <laughs> i don't know i hope i have not a fucking parent um but but uh it's uh, yeah it's i it's um uh, it, it i want to um, be as clear about my intentions and the reasons for have the reasons for writing the play be apparent in the play without because I, I can't run to you know the, the production in Dallas or Phoenix and be like no it's like this like this has to this has to communicate as clearly as it can what is important to 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 me like uh um and and the and the the people and the circumstances that I'm that I'm that I'm writing about and the rest is a lot is kind of up for interpretation um but there's I I, I um I went I, I went to see the Polish production of Cost of Living um and uh it was one of the worst experiences of my, <laughs> my artistic life um because they cut so much of the play um they changed it and I, I learned that it felt like they they thought that they were giving me a gift of they were like well we fixed it and I was like no why all I all I have are my like when I'm if I were Chekhov and I were dead for so long and or Shakespeare and we've had versions of these stories that we know like when you're making a change to Uncle Vanya you know what that change is because you know Uncle Vanya when you've changed a new play it doesn't get the chance to live on its own and speak for itself and be the be be the the show why the reason that this writer took the took took the the the, the time and agony to to write it and so what did they want to share um so i i, I was it was i, I was very sad <laughs> they restored the text since then because i was so sad um but did i did you ever direct or do you want to no i don't know i don't want to talk to no i don't want to manage people no, I like being behind the table. <laughs> um, I would like to direct in film because it seems like that's the only way that you have power over what story is shared. And that's the whole reason to do the thing is most likely um, to remedy something which felt dishonest about an experience that you feel close to um, uh, is to have that autonomy. But in the theater, no, I because the playwright the playwright has the final word. I'd rather just stay and be the, be the playwright. And I like that. I like having like a wing person to be like, what do you think? And having a partner um, who then is much more eloquent to, about talking to actors than I am. Uh, so no, thank you. <laughs> what is so coming closer? We're going to open up some. What are the great plays you saw? The great, what the, what are the writers you look up to? Or who influenced you? I love Connor McPherson, August Wilson, um, Dominique Moriso. I think people, I think I love writers who love their characters. I respect that so much um, and I can feel they're, they're trying to make these characters alive um, and I, I value being moved in the theater. I, 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 ideas are fine. Ideas are for essays to me. Like ideas will come, but I want to feel the, my entire body um, in connection with another human being. I want to cry. I want to cry. It's my favorite thing is just to go cry in the theater. Um, I cry in moments of kindness. I don't cry at sadness. I cry when someone's generous. Um, when when there's like a a, a gift offered to somebody, um, uh, or when there's a surprise, like when someone sings happy birthday on stage, I fucking lose my mind. Uh, <laughs> um, but I yeah, I want to. I also like like feeling like I'm in these 
very specific personal worlds that feel like you know you're entering like a snow globe of an experience and you're that you're invited into um who else the nottage is, is somebody who does who does that paula vogel um uh carol churchill in, in her in a very you know in a very different way but but also but yeah um also i love i'm like the, love the fairy man i love these epic arthur miller these like these these stories of uh of quote everyday people that are expanded to the epic that I that I I love, um, yeah things like I'm, I'm sure once I leave here I'll come up with seven other writers that I didn't mention I'll feel really bad but those are the ones we start with. Yeah, that's I mean I agree. It, it, the audience should cry, not the actors on stage, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah the audience should yes, yes make yeah, it cry. That's much better, and uh, that means something is working. That's great acting if you um, um, can do that. So um, we're slowly going to open up, but I thank you for sharing. No, really. And uh, I would like to remind everybody, there are a lot, lot of people who want to write plays. I think 15,000 students each year in America graduate from academies um, to write something that works, that touches, you know, that um, resonates also, you know, with your story, you know, how personally you had to fight for it, how hard it was. So, you know, we really respect that and um, that you stuck to that and that you created something incredibly beautiful coming out of that, that, that perhaps even torture, you know, where you tell the truth. And, um, and Michael Frain, who once was here, has said, uh, you know, a good play is where every character is right. Yes. Yes. It's the, it's people in the right versus people in the right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So this is very different thinking instead of kind of a moralizing educational theater. And I think uh, your uh, plays also have that. And, you know, you know, going on with your HBO series, Florence, the musical um, you, that's going to come up. It's, you know, so really um, so wonderful to see that also the good prevails and that, if, as you point out, not always also luck involved, but still is a tremendous talent and a tremendous, tremendous amount of work and dedication, which, of course, you didn't talk about so much tonight, but I, I can, one sees that and one knows that. So really, um, thank you. And I think it's a privilege for all of us to spend some time with such a, a great artist who we can also follow will be interesting what she's going to do. What's this going to be a play in five horrifying. years and 10? Huh? Okay, I'm so scared. It's like the no, pressure. No, You're like, what are you going to do now, girl? Play. It's a play. It's called a play. We play. You know, uh, Goldoni, Carlo Goldoni said, do we play, ladies and gentlemen, or not? You know, is that so? But you you do. And participate in the game in a way also of life. So, but let's open up um, to the audience, and let's hope uh, that this is not the moment where the, the mic uh, goes out. You have to speak in it because, you know, we have Halran. So um, if you have a question or a comment, it's one of the rare moments where you can ask a great artist something, and she, she might even say something back also, to you. Please, yeah. please, I just want to be useful. If you're like, how do I, like, survive in the American theater, and, like, what the hell do I do for survival, whatever, please, please, like... It's a quick question. You mentioned me. movies, film. Are you tempted to become a screenwriter? I am. And the reason why is because I really enjoy health insurance. <laughs> I love it. The WGA is fantastic. Um, but also the thing about the, I, what is beautiful about the theater is that there's so, you know, it's so, we're all in the same space together but it's also what is troubling about the theater is that we all have to have access to that same space. We have to have the money to, um, pay the babysitter to like come take the train to then come to the pay for the tickets to you know get a snack to go watch like it, it's it's it can be um exclusionary uh to to the the ac the access to a story because of just how the theater you know especially in this in especially in america so what i love about film is you can just i can send a link to my family in poland i can send a link to my friend who's nursing her child at home um who you know doesn't have the time or the money to 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 come out and so then they can see the stories that are that are potentially about them um so i'm very yes i'm doing three films right now um one that was supposed to be shot in october <laughs> because of the strike is not going to be shot in march two of them are adaptations and one is um uh well, how, it's just how around whatever one i'm adapting cost of living to a to a film that I'm writing right now. I hope I hope it's good. <laughs> here and then. Um, it's great to wow. It's <laughs> great to be here. Um, thanks for sharing all your experiences. And um, I'm a playwright, and uh, very curious about how do you know when it's done? Because I just feel like it's very hard to know until someone tells you it's done. Like, how do you 
decide like no 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 more rewrites this is the definitive version sometimes it's because people are like the actors are stop, are rebelling and they need to so you need to stop writing um but i i feel like when you can stand behind what it's saying when there's enough people who um uh oh i had i forget who said this to me she, the, it was a it was a, a, play, a playwright themselves was uh w- Imagine what is the, the, your play has just ended. The, the audience has filtered out. What is the worst thing somebody could say that your play is about as they're waiting for the train? And if you can make sure that that's not what your play is doing, uh, that you can, that you can at least say, this is what I wanted to say. This was, if they can read your urgency and intention legibly enough, um, if you feel like you've conveyed that thing that is so personally um, moving to you that that matters more than anything to you, so much so that you had to like do go through the agony of writing a play, and that's legible for other people, I feel like that's when you because we can always like futz with our you know with our with our I mean just go, Tony fucking Kushner is still rewriting Angels in America, and you're like, I think it's fine, but uh, he you know there, there's always something you can fix with there. I think there's some there's plays that are just they're they're time capsules for a period of your life. Like I would never rewrite the play that I wrote when I was twenty three years old you know like i'm not that person anymore um that that i think it's worth you know leaving alone because that it it's it's just that was that was of a certain time but if if you feel like you've they can people can read your intention that's so that that's that the that then then you've then you can let it let it go i think but you know it's hard <laughs> right so hi it's thank you for coming my name is fontelles you mentioned that your Situation may you go into your room and devote your time to quiet activities. So I assume you didn't have time to watch TV or go to the movies as much. Do you think if you had had the access to more TV in your spare time, you will have started with TV and film versus theater? I, I mean, I was a latchkey kid. So it was like my, you know, the the TV was on on mute. Um, and I was reading the closed captions so that I wouldn't, you know, it inspired the ire of my stepfather um uh so like you know i was raised on full house and family matters and these like these little fake families that i could pretend to be a part of um after school uh i it would have made more sense for me to have see have become a television or a or a, a screenwriter because those are the things that i had access to because they were the cheaper things you know we had free there was the free cable all i needed was to buy a television have electricity um or not cable but, but basic you know basic tv um or you know you'd go to the movies for like two for one tuesdays uh you know and 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 see jurassic park for seven dollars um uh versus a play i didn't see a play until i was 18 years old um, or th- a piece of theater until i was 18 years old um and i think i started doing it be, be, uh, when I got to college because I fell in love with that little family that you make when you're in the rehearsal room um, that are that are uh, obsessing with you for a month about the, about the same thing and you have a, a guaranteed group of people to see at the same time in the same place for somebody who like didn't have much stability I'm like this is amazing they're just you're gonna you're gonna be in the place that you said you were gonna be and we're all gonna work on a play together this is I can't, I'm I yes please cab my life take all of my life um but I but it but I I think I had it's interesting the the things that the consumers have more access to are actually harder to for the for the makers to have access to making I guess in that in that way like it was easier for me I had more access to making theater because I didn't have to buy equipment I didn't have to buy, I don't have to have a camera, um, but I could, you know, have people in a room. And so I think I, I, I um, yeah, accidentally found the more rarefied <laughs> of, the, of the art, of the art making um, from the, from the consumer side, but it should have been probably TV and film. <laughs> yeah. Hi, a question or comment? Yeah. Yeah, you play writing questions, so I love it. Let's nerd out about playwriting questions. Let's go. Okay. So the debate, I guess, between outlining versus just letting it all out. Cause you know, I'm, I feel like everyone's like, Oh, if, if you have, if you want to write a proper play, you have to, you have to outline and you have to know what's, you know, what the beats are, et cetera, what the dramatic arc is. And I've, I've never really been able to do that. So I'm just curious what your experience is with that of the outlining versus just the impulse and just getting it on the page. Those people are lying to you. Yeah. Is, <laughs> they're lying to you. I have never outlined. I've never outlined it because I feel like if I've outlined it, I've written it. And so I'm like, well, 
just read the outline. Like I, you know, I feel like I've processed also, you just don't know, you don't know what surprises are in store for you as your, what characters are going to come in from the, from, you know, the, the, the periphery of your subconscious. And then it's going to, the play is going to be actually about, be about them. Um, that I, that I think you're in a headspace when you're writing and you're, and you're making, and you're in the world and you're hearing the voices. There's a different headspace from, from the outline. Like the outline is a to-do list and that's just a different part of the, the, the brain and the imagination. Um, uh, I've, 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 I've known friends who, uh, will, when you, when you do TV and film, like they want the beat sheet, but, but, uh, certain, certain writers who like cannot work that way, they'll actually have written the whole episode or the whole screenplay and then like give the beat sheet to the producers because they needed to, they needed, they didn't know what it was going to be until they, until they went through the, the writing, the, the, the writing part of it. Um, so no, I, yeah, I've never, I've never outlined, uh, but I wish, I feel like I would be a better television writer if I was better if I was better at it. So it's whatever it, I think it's also whatever works for you. Like there's there's no roadmap to any of to any, you know, any of what we're what we're doing. And uh, part of the writer's and artist's life is figuring out the ways that you can organize your life such that you can access those kind of like magical sacred moments of making and 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 igniting your imagination, however they work for you. Um at most most like writing books i've read the only they have no good advice but they're most like yeah it's hard and then you're just so happy to like have had somebody be like nah, yes i i also struggle and you're like oh thank you so much um sorry one more the, the swim in the pond in the rain by george saunders is one of the best um books i have read about writing and the majority of it is is like yeah i don't know what the fuck i'm doing either welcome you know <laughs> welcome fellow writer. one last question I have no experience with writing or or um, or theater, actually. But I'm just curious, how do you find your producers for this play, for the play that, um, you know, for your for your upcoming play? Like, how how did that come about? I'm curious. Some sometimes a commercial producer will like if they, especially if there's a property that um, like a piece of IP or, a, you know, like a, you're adapting a book like they may have the rights to it. And so they're looking for um, writers based on like your 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 work before when, when I when I didn't know anybody, I um, I looked at playwrights bios. And I looked at all the awards that they won and the fellowships that they won, and I researched them and was like, "Can I apply?" And I applied to all of the ones I, that I could apply for, um, which then meant I was doing interviews with producers or producing organizations um, and meeting people. There's a there's there's I think there's the in in the playwrights. Uh, brain and time time pie chart i think it's divided into threes one is only one is writing the other the other two are administrative and um networking and meeting people um and networking can have like a bad connotation but it's just like hello friend i am i am this person could we be could we work together in some in some way and 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 seeing if there's a, a partnership of mutual um uh benefit in art making that you could that you could um that you could have with this other person but it's you can you can write the best plays but if nobody knows you know good play falls in the woods and you know you don't know you don't have any friends who are producers then well um so i i yeah i would like i would i would i would th thieve like what other people want see if i could see if i can get them i would go to readings for that, that were free and i would introduce myself to people who I found their faces on the internet and was like, oh, you're the literary manager. Great, I'm gonna go up to you. I'm gonna interest myself because there is their job to find you. Um, they should get to know you because you might be the next great writer. And wouldn't it, wouldn't they feel like little shits if they didn't say hello to you when you went up to them and made their job so much easier by, by being like, here, this is who I am and what I do. Uh, and um, going to friends, uh, making other friends and the actors, directors, dramaturgs, and going to their things and supporting them, and then creating your tribe of people that you can make with. If nobody is giving, is opening the gate for you to have a stage, you can make your own with other collaborators that will that will bring that will potentially bring you along with them. Um, uh, so it's you know being friend, not not being a dick to anybody too much, being friendly, making. Uh, and doing and doing the work that then when somebody does offer you the opportunity you're ready you're ready with the thing to show who you, who you are and what you do um, but there is the, I I found that there is a there's a you just you just have to you have to risk and put yourself out there to to just know to start to come to know people um, uh, and then eventually as you as you amass more work and more people see it then the producers start to come to you 
with a <laughs> so you see it's all very easy <laughs> here you go well um maybe you know as a as a closing moment you read a little bit more from um, a monologue or something from from the cost of living what you have with us and i would like to thank you i mean also for coming back you have been at the seagull before so we're very happy um about that and i just wanted to say one of the lines which i liked from the queen's play it said uh they have problems too, America, right? <laughs> so this is so maybe tell us a little bit about, uh, you read a little bit more from this about the- The, the monologue of cost of living? Yeah, okay. something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, because they do have problems too, America. Yes. <laughs> well, this is, uh, you know, from an American. Um, I, this is maybe my- I think it's always incredible to hear the poets read their poems, the writers read their, it's a very different, Tone, so it's something to really listen to. Yeah, it's so um, exposing. I can never do what actors do. You guys are magical. Um, okay, so this is the opening monologue of Cost of Living. The shit that happens is not to be understood. That's from the Bible. The shit that happens to you is not to be understood. So see, this fucked me up a little. One day comes this call from Columbia Presbyterian. Is this Mr. Torres? There's been a complication. I'm 49, and I've done nothing but love the fuck out of this woman for two decades and a year almost. Nothing. Who deserves that? And a week from her birthday, seven days, we were going to go to Maine for her birthday, see the trees. I leave the lights on now. Every room. Smoke signal. I'm still here. Holidays are hard. Christmas next week? That's going to be hard. But listen to me, holy shit, the gloom. Get a drink on me. Made a promise to myself, a penalty. I start talking gloom, I get it in the wallet. Let me buy you a drink. What do you want? Order what you want. I'm playing. This place is my fucking swear jar. Order what you want. Go ahead. Me, myself, personally, I'm off it. That first day you wake up to find you are not in a pool of some kind of liquid, my friend. Vomit, say, or piss. That day... That day is a beautiful fucking gift upon your life, man. You are grateful for that day, and you are ready. That day is the day it's all going to change. Signs are real. This I know because I used to drive trucks. Cross country. Loved it. Loved every aspect of the job. The scenery, every aspect. The fucking scenery? Utah? Jesus H, man. Utah's gorgeous, and no one even knows. But then I got popped for a DUI in a car blocks from home, lost my CDL, Shit's Creek. So I got the memories and some unemployment. That life is good for people. I was thankful for every day the Anivetti at the Trucker Robots. That life is good. The road, sky, the scenery. Except the loneliness. Except in the case of all the, you know, loneliness. This was what my wife was good for. Not that this was the only thing. But everyone what's married there is, you know, the fuck day is like, fuck, what did I do? What did I actually fucking do here? Because, you know, you married a person and a person's going to be a person even if they're married. That's a lesson. That's a lesson for your life right there. But still, I, I still, <laughs> still loved her. She would text me on the road at night in motels, which alone can be, can drum up certain feelings. This is why there's Bibles in motels. We're all of us in motels on the road to somewhere we ain't at yet, and that makes us feel feelings. Roads are dark and America's long. And I mean, this wasn't poetry, these texts. This wasn't like, you know, poetry. Thinking of you, how's things? Your check came today, off to bed, good night. That little buzz in my pocket around the nightstand, that's the rope gets tossed down to you at the bottom of that well when the thoughts come, you know. The thoughts, that loneliness, the texts, they're like, climb on up out of there, you know, get up out of those thoughts, you know, because thinking of you. Truckers got wild imaginations, lots of time to think. Just not much time to do much with all we've been thinking except what don't take time at all and what's cheap. Salud. Mm. Nazdrovia. She taught me that and sleep, and we sleep if we can. So I started texting her after she passed, like every few days, thinking of you, off to bed, hope you're well, miss you. <laughs> I'd lie a little too, job hunt's going good, and joke, my love to Jesus, slip in a good word. What are you wearing? 
it was nice to talk, to think of her. I mean, it was just a nice thing that happened. I owe you another, by the way, for the gloom. So I, I was hoping that for like community service, they'd give me a gig that was around people, like bringing food to old people or like being in plays, walking puppies, something like that, brushing cats. But I'm painting fences in Livingston, humane societies full up. So now my phone's got all this paint and shit on it now on the cover, thinking of you. I probably shouldn't be here at uh, at St. Maisie's here in uh, Williamsburg here. All you young people here with your fashions, with your natural wine, probably shouldn't be here. This is seltzer, this for now. It's maybe not good for me right now to be here too close. You know how sometimes you get so close, you just get a little too close. Moss, man, like a moth. I know I shouldn't be here, but I'm tonight I'm I'm coming home from painting fences, right? Take the train, bus, walk, I'm home, shower, eat like usual now, alone. And I'm sitting in my house, my apartment, my home, and I'm looking at the boxes, all the boxes of her stuff. And I'm thinking how this was her mug, her bowl she liked, the chair, and I'm tempted not gonna lie I'm tempted as all fucking fuck not even seven yet places will be open stores and even if they're not them bars I can do whatever I want I remember I can do what I want because why not actually actually why the fuck not and that's when the phone buzzes on the table I didn't scream but shit I jumped thinking of you too I may or may not have pissed myself at that moment it's my wife it's coming from my wife, her number, her number, my wife, fucking, fucking Ani, Anya Wutsia Skowronska Torres, my wife. And then I realize, I realize her number, they gave away her number. She's officially gone. And I'm straight up tempted right then. Why not? It's not even seven. Why not? Buzz, thing buzzes again. Where are you? I wonder how long this person's got my messages for. I wonder if I should be embarrassed. I sent her a picture one time of a fence I painted. I don't remember everything I said. Buzz, I'm at St. Maisie's. This is not my wife, this is not my wife. I know, cause come on, this is not my wife. I wanna make it clear to you that I don't think this, but in that moment, in that moment, I was comforted to know she's with the good guys, with St. Maisie, and that heaven is Catholic. Buzz, it's a bar. Buzz, MBK, the fuck is Buzz, Brooklyn, thank you. Buzz, Williamsburg. Buzz, you. Buzz, you. It's seven o'clock in Bayonne. The snow just started falling, and I wonder what to do. This is not my wife. This is not Ani, my wife, but. But honestly, I don't know what else to do, except I do. I do know what else I could do to do. I always know what else I could do. But maybe, maybe something, the shit that happens is not to be understood. And so maybe I should get some fucking pants on and go. I'm in a cab. Okay, my car don't tell nobody. I'm on the path. I'm on the L. The L. I'm here. I'm here. And nobody looks like my wife or at me. Except you. You're, you're real nice. You're a real nice guy, man. I ain't been buzzed yet, texted since, so maybe whoever, you know, she's gone. Man, a ghost ever stood you up, man? Shit, listen to me, the gloom. That's number three, you're killing me here. Get a drink on me. No, 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 don't even think about passing, man. I owe you my treat. You know what, though? Whoever it is, was, Miss Maisie, St. Maisie, whatever this place is, fucking, I hope she's having a good night. I say that genuinely, man, even though she stood me up, the punk, I'm playing. I hope she found someone here and ended up she's having a real good night right now, whatever that means to her. I hope she, <laughs> I hope she found someone to share the night with. That's important. Seemed like she really needed someone to talk to. It's important. Go ahead, man, drinks on me. Made a promise to myself a penalty. You could just one more drink for all I put you through. Go ahead, I'm paying. Please. It's all so personal. <laughs> For being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come in, will we have a little line?
There's wine. A little reset if you stick around a little bit. There's wine, I'm sticking around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's so strong.